Holiday Gurus Guru Cast. Hello and welcome to the latest and sadly what is the final episode of the second season of Holiday Gurus Guru Cast. And um, it's been what can only be described as a very, very long journey to get to this point. It is now uh, close to the end of June and the planning for this began in the middle of February. So we're at a point now where we're all a little bit tired, but we want to make one last push and give you something excellent so you can kind of ride off into the summer sunset with. And to do that today, I'm joined by Ella. Ella, how are you? Um, as always, marvellous. Excellent. What, what do we have in store today? Um, I'll be taking everyone, or you lovely readers really, on a little musical journey around the world. So I'll be looking at um, some very famous musical styles from Europe and also a little bit further abroad and sort of sharing a bit of trivia and also some recommendations if you're there yourself. Nice one. And as well as Ella, there is the uh, evergreen and ever hilarious Shane. How are you, Shane? I'm doing f- well and fantastic <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely nailed Fan well tastic. <laughs> Fan well tastic. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm a bit sad now because like, I don't get to talk about all these really interesting things every week. Instead, I have to just do my na- normal day job. It's pretty sad times. But uh, today, today we've got a special one for you guys. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. I know Martin is pretty, pretty excited about it. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got an interview with... Uh, one of the members of the De Laurentos. Woo. 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 Um, and I've also got my final top five with the longest flights in the world. So you can look forward to that now presently. Nice one. And uh, yeah, so this is something that's hopefully going to build up your enthusiasm for the summer, which is just around the corner. And um, so we won't really delay any further with more small talk. Let's get right into it with Ella's Where To, How To. to how to so we have a bit of a musical theme today with our last episode obviously martin had the opportunity to chat with the de Laurentiis and um, i thought i'd continue that vein of logic and look at world music um i myself i love music i, I grew up i'm not the world's greatest musician i'll put that out there but yeah, I you're did, very good i grew up she's like very a, humble i would say she's <laughs> She has a talent. She can slot that bass big time. <laughs> yes, yes. But I mean, I I grew up with like some musical background. Like my dad works as a roadie, and obviously, like my mum, my parents, my grandparents listen to like loads of styles of music, and that got me thinking today of um, yeah, music is a fantastic way of experiencing foreign cultures. I think it's like a window into a country's psyche, their character, the history as well. Um, so when you're off gallivanting around the world or even just popping over to Europe, um, I thought I'd have a look at the music, musical styles there and bring you some recommendations so you can really have that authentic experience when you're there yourself. Um, our first stop in my musical journey is Spain. Obviously it's only a couple of hours, well not even that, it's just a short hop away really. So you don't really have to go far to really sort of experience some amazing music and obviously what is more amazing than flamenco like it is the sort of defining hallmark of andalusia but also kind of spain as a whole like it's one of the things we definitely associate yeah, with like, the country it's like the passionate kind of nature of spain is like encompassed by this music mm, you know what i mean exactly and the interesting thing is that no one really knows where flamenco came from um there's a couple of theories they say that it was sort of born out of the the mix of culture when the moors and the arabs actually ruled spain and the iberian peninsula as a whole and obviously they brought with them uh, sort of foreign musical traditions, new instruments that were taken up by the local Christian and Jewish populations. Uh, another theory say that it was actually the, gyps- the gypsies who arrived in the 15th century and they brought with them their dances that they picked up from their travels in the Middle East and India. So, yeah, no one really knows where it comes from, but it's obvious that it was definitely born out of that mix of culture, and um, which I find very interesting. Um, but modern flamenco is a serious business. Um, If you want to become a flamenco musician, you need years of practice because as a genre, it essentially has its own system of musical rules surrounding the harmonies, uh, the time signatures, and there's 50 styles or palos of flamenco to learn. And interestingly, some can only be be performed by women, some can only be performed by men, but obviously times are changing. Some styles that are traditionally only for men are now being performed by women as well. I never thought that would translate to music as well. No, and that's that's also interesting as well is that guitars, like we also think about like Spanish guitar, like it's it's a core bit of flamenco, but it's actually the singing that is the, the... 
the most important bit of flamenco. Yeah, I mean, like the the one of the really cool things I find is like the voices with the mm. way they sing. It's like the vibrato is so amazing. Exactly, they use the voice as an instrument because really, like when you look at the notation of flamenco music, the the vocal range is actually very limited. But they use the different sort of like the vibrato, mm. the different sort of quality of your voice, like makes their voice such a. Yeah, it's a diverse and powerful it's instrument, instrument in itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, some recommendations, obviously, if you want to watch flamenco, which obviously you should, because it is an amazing experience. Um, it is also sort of marketed as a, a touristic, um, you know, it's marketed to foreign visitors from America, like from America and Asia. So, I mean, it's... Mm. there's a thing you can get very touristy performances of flamenco as well but also on the other hand um sort of these larger productions also tend to be the most sort of strictly professional ones in a way but the best way to really experience flamenco is just going to like a really tiny venue when you're in a room with like 20 or 30 people and they're all there just tucking away at tapas and just listening to the music and just letting that atmosphere just take you to another world and obviously the best place to see flamenco is Andalusia. Um, you can go to Cordoba, to El Cardenal, which has been hosting flamenco for over 25 years. And it's situated in a sort of uh, Mudaha style building, which obviously comes with all the Moorish and Arab influences. So you can definitely sense that um, amazing sort of mix of culture that Andalusia is famous for. Um, Granada, you can head to the Albaizin neighbourhood for really intimate performances. Um, places like El Templo de, del Flamenco and Jardines de Sorar. God, that Spanish is also really bad, but those that's are really top-notch locations. But to be honest, like you could just walk around and you'll hear flamenco everywhere. And Seville is the capital of Andalusia, and it's also like a really beautiful city to boot as well. But it obviously has a huge flamenco scene. Um, there are like private music clubs called Peñas. If you can find them and you can you know where they're meeting. It's probably the most intimate performance that you'll get, but it's also at the same time very informal. So from a professional point of view, maybe it's not as technically good in a way, but it's just the atmosphere and it's the real sort of, you know, you can see how flamenco is just a way of life for these people. Um, you can share the passion for it with them. Um, obviously, you have more glitzy, but, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> You have the more glitzy productions in theatres, or my personal recommendation, uh, El Tamboril and El Rejaneo, which are two very small bars which always have um, like weekly performances and they're just filled with locals and it is the way to do it. Um, from Spain now we move on to Portugal. They may be next door neighbours but actually their musical traditions are very different. Flamenco is more, much more upbeat, um, sort of... Uh, fiery kind of music but yeah, passionate yeah passionate. but um well portugal's uh fado music is also very passionate but it's a different sense it's the other side of the coin yeah exactly and it's sort of the the clues in the name like fado means fate in portugal and the lyrics are all to do with sort of um yeah lamenting like the fact Love that you're lost and all that sort yeah of stuff. You're separated from your lover the he's classics. out to sea because obviously portugal was a huge seafaring nation obviously there are a lot of wives left behind without their husbands or you know there's the sort of sadness that comes with that and it translates into very passionate very um yeah sort of really emotional lyrics um and um yeah the best places to go really sort of in lisbon which you know Fado is def like a must on your itinerary if you visit Lisbon. Um, I don't really have any personal recommendations in terms of bars, to be honest. But if you just walk around the Alfama and Barrio Alto uh, neighborhoods, you'll find like, you'll just follow the music essentially. You'll see like, there's like little homemade signs to say like, yeah, Fado music here tonight. And that's pretty much a winner. Um, so you can just stroll in and just sit down and have a few yeah. drinks and just listen to the music because it really does captivate you. And, Sometimes like you'll get an odd local, like if they know you're foreign, maybe they'll sit down with you and translate the lyrics for you as they go along and you'll hear this whole story about this poor woman who'd never see her husband again. You know, it's it's an amazing little journey to experience, to be honest. It is yeah, very moving. Possibly a great place to go post breakup as well. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> um from Portugal now to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, we go to Cuba and this is um one of my favourite um, well, I couldn't really call it a style because there are so many styles within Cuban music and um, it's also the history has influenced the music a lot and obviously Cuba is a very interesting history. Um, the musical traditions of Cuba are unbelievably rich. Uh, sort of, It's like a smorgasbord or 
cornucopia of different musical styles that have come over to the island and they've just fused and created their own sort of spin-off genres and there's I couldn't list them because there's just so many of them but as obviously you can notice the influence from the um sort of African rhythms there's uh flamenco also influenced it salsa jazz like the list goes on really yeah, it's like a melting pot of different kind of music exactly styles, you know? like obviously the African influences from the slavery that happens but also sort of a lot of European immigrants especially from Spain moved over and they brought their you bring your musical traditions with you and obviously it's kind of birthed this incredible heritage of music um and during Castro's time this is very interesting sort of Castro obviously like you can't ban music but it was just the sense that like Cuban music wasn't really exported to the world anymore before Castro came to power there were obviously like Cuban immigrants who went to America like Little Havana like that whole community popped up um in New York uh sort of Costa Rican and Cuban jazz artists were really big on the scene but when Castro came to power obviously they were kind of cut off from the world and they couldn't export their music anymore so it's like a protectionism of their culture as yeah, well yeah exactly and the Cuban music kind of looked inward on itself and sort of new styles were born um, when Castro came to power uh, lyrics kind of took on a more political edge um, sort of lyrics sort of went on to talk about like socialism and also sort of social issues such as racism, colonialism and um, one style that was born out of Castro's time was uh, Nueva Trova um, which obviously focuses on these sort of um, social issues I suppose and one artist in particular is Carlos Ferreira and he was famous because he was not afraid to openly criticise the regime in his lyrics which is quite a big thing to yeah, do Yeah, it's kind of your Dyson with uh things that probably shouldn't be diced with. Yeah, um, and Castro, when the regime ended and sort of um, sort of socialism wasn't really a thing anymore, that brought with it a whole load of other problems such as um, financial difficulties. So people then started singing about their own sort of poverty and problems that they go through, the issues of Havana, like Havana's place in the world and capitalism, like it's really, really interesting sort of the, the musical genre, the musical history sort of documents the happenings in Cuba as it goes along. Um, and now it's a really, really popular, it's gone from being cut off in the world to being an insanely popular genre of world music. Um, you know, the Buena Vista Social Club, like probably the most famous group of all, and they are like top-notch musicians. And their first album, which is also called Buena Vista Social Club, so that's easy to remember. But the whole album is just amazing. Like, I really actually recommend listening to it because you really feel the passion that goes behind their singing and can really get a sense of like the Cuban psyche in a way. And it's just beautiful music that ranges from really fast songs to really slow and thoughtful ones and romantic ones. Like, it's awesome, awesome. And obviously, you don't even have to go to Cuba to experience this, like, you can also go to Miami. You were there yourself yeah. in the little Havana district, which is just, it's a buzz with, like, music, like, Cuban food, like, everything you can think of. It's Live like, bands performing, um, sunny weather, the coffee, selling coffee for, like, 50 cents mm. out of a window. And you, I mean, it's, it's very sugary, but it's the best coffee I've ever had in mm. my entire life. And just seeing... So good vibes. Seeing, the, like, just the animation and the the people and like just people playing like checkers and chess and stuff like that ping pong and they have all their bands playing mm -hmm. it's, and this was a saturday afternoon at like 2 p.m in miami so um yeah like it was it was amazing mm, it's fantastic like even when you're just walking around in the streets of cuba and you just see like friends getting together with their instruments and they're just playing a few songs um and there's one famous song one more recommendation for me um as you listen to a song called hasta siempre comandante and it's some songs in Cuban music are like written, but they're also performed by a lot of artists over time. My favourite performance by of this song is by Compay Segundo, who was actually part of Buena Vista Social Club. Um, but the lyrics to this song are written as a reply to Che Guevara's farewell letter as he went off and fought in Bolivia and everything. And the lyrics all refer to sort of the very important moments in sort of the Cuban revolution. So it's a song, but as a history lesson at the same time. So that's a win-win in my cool, situation. Yeah, yeah. My, nice one. Yeah. Awesome stuff, Ella. Thank you for the context and thank you for the contributions over the last 10 weeks that have been uh, um, very educational, very insightful. Yeah, um, it's also like when you go into like that Wikipedia black hole, when you just like, you look up a topic and then like an hour later you're still like looking into really obscure yeah. trivia and I don't know. It's like that recommended uh, stream on YouTube yeah, that can God, just that like, is pull you in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it from Ella for this season. So yeah. yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Nice one. We definitely did. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so let's move on to our next section, which is our interview. Okay, so today we've got a bit of a special interview lined up. Um, for all of you, we're going, we're continuing this like music theme. Um, Alec gave us a great section there about world music, and now we're continuing with it, and we're going for some more kind of up to date music, and we're going to go with uh, the De Laurentos. And um, I know that Martin is an absolutely gigantic fan of the De Laurentos, and when the opportunity came up uh, to interview one of the members, he absolutely jumped at it. Um, and it was only a specific time that we were able to, so this is kind of a different kind of style of interview, but Martin will now give us uh, his interview with Kieran McGuinness of De Laurentos, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Kieran McGuinness from De Laurentos, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? No, not too bad, not too bad. I'm, uh, I'm uh, in between interviews and uh, uh, podcasts and, and uh, blogs and things at the moment, so I'm... Uh, just uh, at a kind of a chilled kind of point right now so that's good <laughs> nice one sure it's great to be busy um i kind of want to start off by saying that so a lot of our listeners and a lot of our readers will be aware of delorentos already but there are some people um from uh the places where we have listeners that may not be too familiar with the origins of the band so could you maybe go into a little bit a bit uh, a little bit of detail about the formation of delorentos well, um, it's the same as, you know, a lot of bands. Uh, Space Jesus came and pointed at each one of us individually and we became kind of imbued with the knowledge that our future was to save humanity with our music. Um, and, uh, well, basically we were friends and we played in bands and we met each other. And, you know, I think it was a funny thing because we knew pretty quickly that we were kind of compatible, if you know what I mean. We... Um, Ross had played a gig in a band with Roe and he came back and went, this fella's great, you know, and i have been playing with Ross and Neil came into practice and started talking about the Pixies and Sonic Youth and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, that, lad, that lad's brilliant. Why isn't he playing with us? And then, uh, uh, you know, when we needed a bass player, he was in and when we needed a guitarist, Roe was in. And then suddenly we discovered that we were all wanted to write songs and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of uh, came together in North County Dublin pretty quickly in summers, in summers in between college and school and stuff. So, nice yeah, and then it's, it started to kind of work. And then our ambition went from, um, you know, let's try and play the, the, the town festival to let's try and write some songs to how about we play, you know, uh, Oxygen some year. And then we played Oxygen and released albums and, you know, it kind of went down from there. Nice one. And um, I can just say that like you guys do complement each other greatly and the formation itself was around about 2005. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, like I knew Ross since I was much younger than that, you know, and I knew Neil from when I was from about 2001 or something, you know, so it was like we got together as the band that we are now in, in about 2005 yeah and then we kind of had a summer of hanging out and going on holidays and stuff and it was a band only in sort of a, uh, <laughs> it was a band because we were we said we were sort of and then we kind of got down to it a bit but yeah we went to Neil was living in Toronto we went on a um, J1 to Toronto in 2005 I think and we all went over to see him and we tried, we flew into New York it was a holiday of a lifetime you know and we spent a week staying in a friend's apartment with a cat in New York and then got a train up to Toronto. And it felt like after that holiday, sort of after that trip, you know, we were a band, you know, because it was just, we were so tight then, you know. So, yeah, and then we started trying to make music and sure, that took a while and that was good. Of course, and like they are very formative years from the point of college the whole way throughout your 20s. So like by the time 2015 comes around, you already have four albums under your belt and you decide to uh, write, uh, begin writing and composing your fifth album, which has just been released in April of this year. Um, I'm just kind of wondering, as you evolve and as you get older, does the creative process change behind the, pro er, behind the creation of an album or is there like a constant recipe or pattern that you guys have followed? Not really. Um, you see, see, it's kind of. I don't know what it's like for other bands because I haven't really been been in a Tin Lizzy cover band. But what it, for original bands, I haven't really been in that many others, so I don't really know what it's like for them. But I know for us, it's different every time. It's different every song, um, because you know I could write a batch of songs over the summer and. Uh, 
they might be about where my life is, you know. And then Ro might be writing songs and they're, you know, just about, you know, things that he's seen or he's taught. And maybe Ross wanted to write a song because he wanted to write something for a dance floor or over a breakup. You know, we're, we all have different kind of lives and different um, things going on and whatever else. And when we convene with our songs, they can be often... Uh, like wildly different, you know. So then what we do is we all kind of sit down with the batch and we work through them and see what we have and kind of make short lists and things like that. And sometimes um, the songs that I might think of the, the the songs that are the good ones are often, you know, ones that other people kind of really kind of latch on to. Um, on this album especially because um, we're all... Like this is our fifth album, right? So you know we're in our thirties. You know I have ki- I have two kids. Neil uh, Row is a kid. You know Neil's living in London and commuting back. So like we all have really kind of complicated lives, you know, and um, it's all very very good and exciting. But it means that uh, where where we connect, where our kind of lives connect, is this kind of uh, kind of figuring out what we want to kind of do. You know, um, up until now, you know, when you're twenties, you're writing songs about going out and having a good time and drinking and discovering the world and stuff but when you get into your 30s then and you you know you're kind of starting to I don't know like map your life a bit and figure out who you are and where you are sure. then the songs kind of take on a different meaning and um, they become introspective and questioning and sometimes they become less um, with the kind of benefit of writing I suppose okay. you know, having written a few songs they become less kind of uh, uh I, I maybe stereotypical or, or less kind of formulaic and that changes the recipe and pattern again so yeah it, it isn't the creative process is always bring us your best songs everyone does that and then we muck in and we see where we kind of what we end up with okay and for that um muck in phrase i'm not quite necessarily sure if it refers specifically to this but i can see that for the true surrender album um it, you did meet up in northern Spain to try and, I don't know, I guess, um, get it down on paper, get it down on a record and, and trying to see how different things sounded and stuff like that. I, I think northern Spain in particular is very, very interesting because I hear a lot of people picking that as a place to try and, um, I don't know, give a bit of meat to their creative thoughts and stuff like that. So like, in terms of music, there's other stories like the Water Boys who have an affinity with the West of Ireland and acts like Bonnie Iver who would like lock themselves in a cabin just until the finishing line has been reached. I'm just kind of wondering, is location an important factor for you guys or is it just a case of being able to meet up at the same point when you're all leading such different lives as you alluded to earlier? Um, well, location definitely is important. Uh, one thing that works really well for us is that we're all sort of sequestered somewhere. Um, and, you know, you lock the doors and you have a kind of a camp mentality um, because life is, you know, busy and, and annoying. And, you know, it, it can be very, uh, you can be at the mercy of, you know, other people and stuff. So um, that's always been a thing. You know, for, for Little Sparks, our third album, we rented a, um, a B&B in them. Um, in uh, Tinnahili in Wicklow and <laughs> you know put all the furniture up against the wall set up all our gear and practiced you know from morning to night and then one of the days one of the kind of uh, I think the owner of the house came around and was I think probably a little bit shocked to see what you know we were like a band rehearsing in his house and all that kind of stuff but um, and all the pot noodle boxes everywhere <laughs> but um, we uh, yeah we were on tour in Spain and we, that was part of the, the, uh, the thing for this album that um, we were kind of you know, eking out blocks of time when we were all together. So we had, you know, when you go on tour, you generally play gigs on the, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you're off um, on the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever it is, you know, you, those days you kind of don't gig as much. So you do have three or four days to kind of block off and, and start working. So in one of those blocks, um, we arrived at this uh, um, kind of vineyard in North Spain, which had a, um, a wine factory a nice wine one. distillery i don't know a <laughs> wine place and um in in the building was a, a record studio and so that was where we went with our first batch of songs and started getting working on it and just spent you know spent five days standing up in front of a microphone with a guitar around your shoulders and playing playing songs and then we came out of that and in a normal album process they would have probably been the bulk of our album that would have been the first set and then you work through those you get them as good as possible and then you release them you know um, 
and yeah, it was an amazing kind of place to go. Uh, it was incredibly clear. So in the morning, you'd wake up, and we, we had kind of a dorm kind of room, and you'd wake up in the morning, and you know you could see, you know you could see miles, you know uh, miles and miles into the distance, which was vineyards and and kind of countryside, and you walk. We would walk first thing in the morning through the vineyard to uh, the winery and you know chat along the way and it, like it felt it felt like a real kind of experience you know okay um, and then we get there and we work till night time and walk back at night and um, through the you know the kind of dusty kind of roads there wasn't uh, cars really driving along them and it did feel like you were away from everything it felt because obviously you know you're in a different country but also it just felt like we could we did have time to you know, really unpack the songs and stuff. Unfortunately, we came back and we thought that maybe the songs just didn't suit where we were in our lives. Um, and we started to, there was one song in that batch, which was called In Darkness We Feel Our Way, which was this For kind sure. of uplifting, hopeful, hopeful kind of song, which had a depth to it. And as well, it didn't have an answer. And, and sometimes songs that, um, songs that kind of pose a question or, or capture a feeling it's sometimes they don't need to be resolved, you know? Yeah. And yeah true. A lot of, a, a lot of young pop songs are like, this is what happened. And then this is how it ended and whatever. And you kind of go through that. And some of the albums and then some of the songs in the new album didn't feel like they had answers. You know, they were just like, this is where I am. And I'm, I'm trying to process this. And, uh, as I say, with four songwriters, you, you do end up with a, with, a, with a block of songs. And then we started to move towards the songs that were like that, that, that kind of uh, chimed with that feeling of trying to figure out where we were and who we were and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I think the location added a huge amount to that. But, you know, the funny thing about this album was a lot of the locations were our bedrooms um, until we went to Donegal to record where we did it in three blocks uh, of a week of time. Um, uh, separated by two months and then again that felt very much like you know I don't know we were playing say in a place called Terman in um, in Donegal which is about 20 minutes from Letterkenny okay uh, and uh, it's quite remote and it's on the edge of this uh, huge expanse of land which was where the evictions happened and you know through that kind of valley is where the old railway used to go and it's a very kind of evocative place um, not a lot of pubs <laughs> we had to drive to the pub and uh, at the end of, of session and stuff okay. but uh, it felt, felt like we were locked away there as well and that was kind of cool we went out in the garden and played uh, played uh, American football has to be uh, done for has to hours be done. in our, our breaks <laughs> and then okay so like after all that hard work that you're after alluding to there okay it's like the beginning of the process it's 2015 the end result is released in 2018, which must have been an amazing feeling after such a long, uh, a long process. It has received, like the album itself has received some really, really great reviews and uh, justifiable praise, I would say, in terms of being like thought provoking and uh, encouraging people to like self-reflect. And, you know, you were saying yourself about like unanswered questions and stuff like that. Just like really, really powerful message coming through in your songs. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering, was that the specific objective for the album or is that just something that naturally happened by itself over time? No, you, could, you couldn't have an I don't think, look, we're, we would never sit down and say, this is the type of album we're making. You just have to, you just have to sit down and the songs will tell you, you know, um, so, if, for example, if you had, you know, 15, 16 songs and you thought that they were the songs that you were the best songs or the songs that kind of represented where you were the most, um, there would be a through line. There would be a connection between them, you know. And um, like there's other songs written for this album that were very kind of not throwaway, but they would have been more kind of upbeat and, and less and a bit lighter. And they, they just it, it was a bit harder to fit them in. And so um, the ones that kind of connected were the ones that were this kind of questioning, this kind of um, soul, much more of a soulful kind of sound than we've ever had. Um, I think a lot of people who know so probably know us from songs like Secret and, sure. and uh, stuff like that, which is, you know, upbeat and you can dance to them and stuff. And, and you can dance to some of the stuff in, on our new album, but I think you'd be, you'd be dancing, you know, with a more thoughtful face. <laughs> I, can, um, but, uh, I don't think, I don't, you know, you, you, would, you definitely wouldn't be able to... Uh, kind of decide that beforehand I don't think it's possible I think you just sit down and the songs come out and, and like the thing is that like as well it wasn't like um, you know you just write the best album you can you put the best collections of songs together you can and then you try and 
you know, present them in the best way you can. But working on an album feels very separate. You know, if you're if you're a, a football player, like you know, the work that you do is represented on the pitch. So, you know, you can do all the preparation you want, but you go out and you play your game, and then the game is the thing. You know, that is the the representation of who you are, and, and you know, you can be. It doesn't matter what you do outside of it. It really kind of just matters what happens on the pitch at, on a football game. Whereas if you're a, a musician, the the writing that you do and the album that you make could be the best thing you do, and you might be okay at live, and you might be okay at interviews or whatever. But you could be because you've recorded. That's the thing that people can take away and connect to. But then there's also the playing live. So you can have an average amount of songs. They're okay, but you could be an incredible live band, a real visceral, you know, energetic, powerful live band that people want to see and your back catalog can take you. And then there's the other side of it, which is like late period oasis, where you're brilliant at interviews and you are a joy to be on a couch and a chat show and all that kind of thing, you know? Mm. So you can have in music and entertainment and whatever that kind of thing. You can, you know, where you are is a kind of mix of all those things. Um but you never, like when you're locked in the writing process, you're not really thinking about the other two, especially not in this album we weren't. You're thinking about how to make the songs as good as possible. And then suddenly you get to the kind of live stage and you go, Jesus, how are we going to do this? <laughs> you know, how's this going to happen? And then then you start thinking about the, you know, reviews and the performance, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the, the interviews and all that kind of thing. And like I was saying, I, I had a conversation over a beer with a friend and I was like, this is the first time on an album that I do not give a crap. I don't give an absolute shit what anyone says about it because I know what we were trying to say and I know how good it is. And I don't, I feel like if someone gave it an average review, I'd be like, you didn't listen to it, you know, because I don't think you can fail to hear the work that was, it went in, the soulfulness of it and the creativity. You know, I think that, I think whether you, it's your taste or not, I think people will know that the this is a piece of, you know, it's it's a it's an artistic output. You know, it's a, it's 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 written a certain way because it's um, it's meant to be that way. It's not like accidental or whatever. Like the, what I would and, what I would say is well, like yeah, what I was going to say when the reviews came in, I, we were like really presently surprised that people got it because we were worried that people might go, oh, you know, where's the where's the the poppy ones, you know? And but no, people came back and said, you know, they they got what we were saying, they understand where we were coming from, and it was it was just kind of it was an added kind of uh, bonus for us that 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 it, it it did get reviews and stuff but you know it's still a personal thing listen to an album you know yeah for sure like i think the one thing that is undeniable is that like if you were to take the lyrics from the songs you might have said yourself they're not as poppy as like your previous albums but it is like kind of undeniable the amount of depth that the lyrics do actually go into and um, i think that's a credit to the evolution of the band as a whole and um, just another part of the process as you said yourself is is the live aspect i think it, I, I always have this, like I myself, I'm not from a musical background, I'm from more of a sporting background and a travel background, but for people from other other dimensions in life, I kind of always wonder, like, from if I'm looking at the musical world from an outside perspective, and you've been in a position yourself where you're able to play gigs from uh, in places like Mexico or Russia and playing like the Benicassium Festival. And I'm just kind of wondering like what has been a personal highlight for you or maybe the band as a whole in terms of where you have been able to play? Uh, well, I see, yeah, it's, it's different every time um, because lots of different gigs mean lots of different things. It's like playing sport, um, you know, uh, the, the first match that you play after you come back from an injury or something is nearly more important than, you know, the, the cup final or whatever. But I think that um, sometimes it's gigs that you don't expect because gigs that you put a lot of pressure on or people are putting a lot of pressure on can sometimes you can rehearse very much for them. You spend a lot of time doing the set list and, you know, uh, you might you might overthink it or, you, you know, you, you might not be in the moment at it. And then sometimes it's gigs that you just play, you just turn up and you play and it just flows and it, there, there's magic moments, you know. Um, but I remember we played a show in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow and there was a big headline show and it was in this big kind of theatre and, and very... Um, what's the word, uh, uh, not a sterile environment, but a very kind of controlled environment, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was fun and, you know, it was good and there was a lot of people there and 
you know, it was good. But it, it felt like there was kind of pressure on it. Whereas the next night we went and we get brought to this kind of tiny library bar, which was up a staircase at the back of a building and then down a corridor and up another staircase and knock on a door and through, the, you know, this kind of mad, you know, oak library bar. And we played a gig there. And, you know, that's the gig I remember. You know, it was uh, much smaller than the other one, but it was an amazing gig um, to play in like this, you know, cool bar in Moscow, you know. Um, the first time we played, uh, we played support to a, a, a band in a two-door cinema club in Mexico in this big cattle warehouse thing in uh, Guadalajara. And, it, you know, that was just, it was like the Beatles, you know. There was, whatever it was, 5,000 people there from the second the doors opened. So we went out and we played to this absolutely crazy crowd. And, like, you know, we put our hand up and the entire crowd would put our hand up. It was just bizarre. Like, I can understand, you know, that like the, the level of fame that you, you get to, you know, playing to that kind of people. Like, it just doesn't leave. We still get emails from from Guadalajara, you know, about that show. And it's just bizarre. It wasn't the one we were thinking of. So sometimes it's the shows that you don't expect. But um, I think for all, all of us, a specific one might be SOS in Mercia. Um, we played the show in Mercy, we were third or fourth on the bill. We finished after Mogwai and went on before um, the Flaming Lips. And people were singing. One of our songs, Care For, uh, was the song of the festival that was used all in the, in the ads. And people were singing that song when we played it as if it was like, you know, Stairway to Heaven or Mr. Brightside or, or whatever. And it was just, awesome. you know, supernatural, the feeling, you know. I, and I can just say that like when, when you are bringing uh, your work from country to country is one thing but let's say when you are traveling to country or, or country to country yourself as a human being you're obviously going to be influenced um, by the local culture just in terms of uh, musical and I travel almost all the time as a human being as well yeah I mean like that's um, th thankfully that's like a, something that we're very lucky to be able to do as well ourselves I, I kind of from your own travels let's say um, because of if I'm thinking of places like Memphis or uh, Tennessee, like just kind of random places that have a, a, a oh, how would you even describe that? Random places that have a certain uh, style, yeah, personality. Thank you. Um, a, attached to them, has there been any place that you've travelled to on your own travels that have really kind of impacted you or stood out for you in terms of their musical culture? In terms of their musical culture, uh, well, Memphis was a highlight. Um, Obviously, the the night that we were there, there was some sort of festival on. And um, it was St. Patrick's and two night. No, it was the night after St. Patrick's night, and there was a festival on, and it was just crazy. People dancing on the streets. There was a, a big old steel kind of greyhound bus parked in the middle of um, Bloor Street, I think it is, and it was like hundreds of people dancing on it in Irish shamrocks, and I was, you know, in Irish kind of these beads that they throw out to the crowd and I didn't know what that has to do with Ireland but <laughs> it was bizarre but I think the place that as a band that we've gone that's probably impacted on us the most is Haiti after the earthquake in 2011 or 12 we went over to help rebuild houses um, as part of a relief plan and uh, you know, played a gig at the end of it which was a bit bizarre but we actually spent most of the time building um, and Neil for example sat on a roof for you know a week getting incredibly burnt uh, but like just working into the dark um i was doing cement which was <laughs> which was bizarre but i got pretty good at pouring i can pour some pretty good cement now. Uh, anyway i went over and had another clue but now now i can get you the, th the perfect thickness let me tell you nice one and um uh, uh and ro was doing carpentry and stuff it was, you know, absolutely, I never experienced heat like it. I've never worked as hard in my life. And um, I've never been in such a different culture uh, as um, the, 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 you know, the town of Ganaive and the market in Ganaive. And, uh, you know, just that whole world, you know, is a bit of an eye opener. So uh, at the end, you know, the Irish crew had been there three or four times. And, and uh, when we arrived back, you know, they all arrived over with their, you know, everyone brought... Uh, football jerseys from their county and you know all the kids came over and they had their jerseys and like these are guys who's you know don't have a lot and you can't give them a lot of stuff because it makes them targets you know you have to be careful about what you what presents you give but you can give jerseys as long as you give out a lot of them you know mm. and so then you know it was like you just randomly gave out 20 Dublin jerseys for example then that that group of kids became this Dublin Jersey crew, you know, and ended up sort of being friends 
beyond it, bonded by their shirt. And, and there's just it was so many nuances. And, you know, I think life is very different there. And I think it gives you a perspective that you, you know, you, you, you if you're lucky, you hold on to. And I think that was something that's definitely, was, you know, we've definitely, yeah, it was definitely, definitely a location, I guess, that, that kind of stuck with us. Excellent stuff. And I guess kind of just to, uh, to finally uh, wrap up the interview, I'm just kind of wondering what would the plans be for the near future for De La And uh, The near future, the near future is um, uh, a lot of gigs. <laughs> we, today we announced it's, 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 uh, it's Wednesday now, the 30th, and we just announced a chunk of gigs in Ireland. Uh, we've got gigs in the UK, Spain, and Germany to announce uh, uh, next week, right. and then we've got a, a, a block of support slot. It's just going to be really busy for the rest of the year, and it's exactly how we like it. For sure, and uh, coming into the summer season as well, it's an exciting thing to be that active. Um, I'm very happy that you have released an album again. I've been waiting a couple of years for it, and it was definitely worth the wait. Uh, True Surrender is out now, and I definitely recommend that uh, our listeners pick up a copy and also go to see Kieran and Delorento's live because it is a fantastic experience. Uh, Kieran, that is pretty much all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And now, this week's Holiday Guru Top 5. Okay, so for my final segment of the Holiday Guru Top 5, I've got a special one. It's the longest flights in the world. So if you're ever feeling like you need to sit on a plane for a long time, <laughs> you want to check out these flights for sure. Um, so yeah, so and without further ado, I'll get started. At number five, we've got a United Airlines flight from Houston to Sydney, Australia. So it's a distance of 13,833 kilometers, and it takes 17 hours and 30 minutes. So yeah, so there you go. That's a pretty it's long one anyway. But it's just the start. Oh, God. Uh, so at number four, we've got another United Airlines flight. Uh, it's from Los Angeles to Singapore. The distance is 14,113 kilometers. It takes 17 hours and 50 minutes. Um, and yeah, it's not much to say. You go from LA to another continent, to you know? Bob's uh, your uncle. Yeah. Okay, so next on the list then, we've got our first Emirates flight of the list, and it's from Auckland, New Zealand to Dubai. It's a distance of 14,200 kilometers, and it's 17 hours and five minutes. Um, so yeah, so if you ever want to go from New Zealand to the, the, the sandy area of Dubai, it's going to take you a while. Uh, so at number two then, we've got uh, the recently launched Qantas flight from Perth to London. So this comes out at the second longest flight in the world, and it's only just been launched. Um, so it's a distance of 14,500 kilometers, and it takes 17 hours and 20 minutes. So there you go. If you want to go nonstop from London, rainy London to sunny Australia, that's the way to go. Fair old track there. <laughs> yeah. Crikey. And then at number one, we've got the Qatar Airways flight from Auckland to Doha. So the distance is 14,535 kilometers and it takes a whopping 18 hours and five minutes. Guys, can you imagine sitting on a flight for 18 no, no. hours? <laughs> Definitely not. You just end up stuck beside like the worst passenger in the world. It's screaming just no, babies. No one there, look, screaming babies. Well, people with their shoes off would probably be my pet yeah. peeve, but your look, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. This is just amazing though, like how... This is even possible. Like I mean, back in the day, like um, you know, like when I was reading on the road, and the guy was obviously traveling from I think Switzerland to like South America, but then he has to have a stopover in New York, then he has to have a stopover in Mexico, and then he has to have another stopover, and like now we can just do it in one stretch. Like it's just A to B. Like you get on the plane and you just get off at your destination, and there's less stopovers now. But obviously, like it's a trade-off. Like, do you want the shorter flight time, or do you want sort of the option to sort of you know stretch your legs a bit when you yeah, stop true, over and true. i mean i i mean the next the next big thing obviously is going to be the moon or mars you know what i mean like because yeah. like it, it's like the world is getting too small for people and like egos you know, are getting too big yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's also be pretty grim in economy class as well like you'd want to make sure you get like splash out in business class <laughs> like my dad's um like i said he, before he's a roadie and he has to travel a lot 
and um, he said times where like he's had to do really long flights to like Japan for example but then he gets a random upgrade to like business class in the A380 and it's sickening the stuff that you get included in this like you get your own little cab like I don't know what you call it, like cabin essentially. or It's like a little hotel room in the sky. Yeah, and he's like putting pictures of WhatsApp with like him and a champagne glass in his hand and we're like, God, I'm so jealous of like me and Mariner flights yeah, yeah. and you live in the high life, but there you go. Yeah, so there you go. I hope you guys enjoyed it and enjoyed all of my wonderful top fives. I wouldn't see any reason why people wouldn't have enjoyed it, Shane. Um, yeah, so that's sadly where we have to draw our second season to a close. Um, this is the point where we start dishing out some thank yous because without the contributions of a lot of people um, we wouldn't be able to do this for you. Like We are people who do regular 9 to 5s as well and we kind of put our foot down in the sense that we love delivering this type of content to you because we think it adds such um, enriches, a value. Enriches our... Exactly, it enriches our, like, um, I don't know, portfolio. It's like we're, we, we're an octopus with so many legs and these are like extra tentacles for us. I'm, I'm going to stop now because that, <laughs> that was getting creepy. Um, yeah, so first and foremost, there's the mechanics behind the actual sound and we have a, a, a German colleague of ours who's been absolutely fantastic fantastic for us and um, he's very flexible in terms of um his scheduling and stuff like that and just in terms of how much he helps us as well so sebastian weber thank you very much mm. thank there's you. a, a round of applause for that and um, top man <laughs> top man in terms of um yeah zebby has a bit of help as well from um jan schaffenberg lars kobush and also um our colleague johannes as well deserves a bit of a a bit he, of a pat on the back of some tight binds and those guys you know like you can't have the longest flight in the world without the plane you know what I mean exactly they are the engine yeah. carrying us to where we need to go um, yeah thank you to our management for allowing us to leave our desks for so many hours over the course of a couple of months and um, we really really appreciate you letting us do something a bit different and yeah, most importantly, thank you to the two people who have been sitting across from me looking deep into my eyes and I have been reciprocating um, a lot over the last 10 weeks. But uh, Ella and Jane, thank you so much. And thank you to the man who is coordinating it all. Martin yeah, McKenna. big shout Good out man. to Martin McKenna. This guy has put in a lot of work, a lot of hours to bring this excellent content to you guys. So we really hope you enjoy it. And we've enjoyed, as much as we've, mm. even if you even... You enjoy it even half as much as we enjoyed making it for you guys. We'll be we'll be more than happy. Amazing stuff, and um, yeah, just if, if thank you very much, guys. I, I really appreciate that first and foremost. <laughs> um, yeah, so just the the last few things I'd say would be um, for everyone who's uh, listened to us, for everyone who's sat down and spoken with us. Um, we have an unbelievable debt of gratitude to you. And also, I would implore you, if you like what we do, um, or if you think that anyone might, would be interested in what we do, as much as we like the sound of our own voice, we realistically can't continue this unless there is um, a followership, unless there are people to listen to us. So, um, yeah, we would appreciate any sort of subscribers, any sort of likes, any sort of word of mouth um, help in which you can give us. Because as we grow, we want this to grow and we want what we provide for you to grow in terms of quality as well. So, yeah, I'll just probably leave it on that. And fingers crossed there will be a season three. But you guys have to maybe put in a bit of a shift now as well. So, yeah, I don't really know what else to say other than thank you, Shane, and thank you, Ella, one last time. Thanks, thank Martin. You. Thanks, Ella. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> excellent stuff and yeah we will be back with you hopefully again soon so have a nice summer um, try and I don't know keep trying to live the dream and keep trying to broaden your horizons as well uh, thanks very much guys and we will be back with you soon we hope take care See thanks you soon. guys enjoy your summer get out that front door <laughs>